Welcome to our discussion of the 30-year period in Texas from 1971 to 2001. Now, many observers call this 30-year period sort of the emergence of a, quote, modern Texas. Modern in both the economic and political sense. Looking at the economy, the economy became much more diversified. It diversified away from reliance on a couple of agricultural products and petroleum to include significant manufacturing, commerce, and finance. And of course, petroleum and agriculture continue to play an important role in the state's economy. There were even more immigrants coming into Texas. The phrase gone to Texas now is becoming even more common. And there were many more immigrants coming in from Asia, uh, particularly from Vietnam um, after the end of the Vietnam War in the early 1970s. The population became even more urban. Some 80% of Texans lived in urban areas by the year 2000. And it really moved from a completely democratic uh, party structure from the end of Reconstruction in the mid-1870s until this period of time. And so you have now Republican governors and about half of the legislature. By the end of this 30-year period, by about 2000, the state is solidly Republican and has maintained a Republican orientation um, in the two decades since the year 2000. By 1994, the population of Texas had skyrocketed. It overtook New York and became the second most populous state in the country after California. <clears throat> now let's look briefly at women in modern Texas. Um, <clears throat> the political and social upheaval of the 1960s resulted in the formation of many national women's organizations, such as NOW, N-O-W, and they started to set up chapters in Texas in the late 1960s. The U.S. Congress passed an amendment to the Constitution entitled Equal Rights Amendment in 1973, which prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex. And a special election was called in Texas, and Texas voters approved the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, by a margin of four to one. At the same time, one of the organizations um, sponsored in Texas was the Texans Women's Political Caucus in 1971. And Barbara, Senator Barbara Jordan, who we've seen previously, was instrumental in setting that organization up. <coughs> Excuse me. At the same time, there was a very, very important and equally controversial U.S. Supreme Court decision. This is the Roe versus Wade decision. And it originated in Dallas when a group of attorneys in Dallas filed a legal action on behalf of Jane Roe. And they said many other women who wanted to have an abortion against the district attorney to prevent his enforcement of the state's anti-abortion law, which only at that time allowed abortions um, in the event that doctors certified that um, the pregnancy could well lead to the loss of life of the mother. Well, this went up to an appeals court and finally reached the U.S. Supreme Court. And in 1973, the Supreme Court ruled in the Roe versus Wade decision that the Texas anti-abortion law was unconstitutional since it violated a, woman, excuse me, a woman's right to privacy. Those were the grounds on which it was declared uh, unconstitutional. Now, the Equal Rights Amendment never became an amendment to the Constitution 
because it wasn't ratified by the needed three-fourths of the states. It was just a few short shy of the 35 states needed, or 36 states needed. So, but <clears throat> the movement by women's groups called feminist groups at the time and the Supreme Court decision in Roe versus Wade on both a national level as well as in Texas led to a conservative backlash that was often uh, based, or not based, but supported by uh, Protestant religious groups and anti-abortion or right to life organizations. Um, and this characterized more and more the divide between conservatives and liberals. It, there were more these, what were considered cultural issues, it wasn't so much um, the different economic issues of the Republicans and Democrats. <clears throat> and during this period of time, an unprecedented number of Texas women ran for and were elected to a public office. Indeed, by the year 2000, all the major cities in Texas had had at least one female mayor. <clears throat> and this is, just for your information, the text of the proposed Equal Rights Amendment. You can see it's short and sweet. Section 1, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And then it just goes on to say Congress has the power to enforce this. <clears throat> so let's look at the political situation briefly in the early 1970s. In 1971, a survey found that 20% of Texans considered themselves Republicans and 52% Democratic, with the remainder considering themselves independents, independent or saying they didn't really care about politics. Well, during this period of time in the early 1970s, there was the much publicized Sharpstown scandal. Um, the textbook has the details, but the essence of it is the Federal Government Securities and Exchange Commission conduct, conducted an investigation of corruption and found Governor Smith had been involved in corruption with a savings and loan institution by the name of Sharpstown. And this also um, uh, implicated the Lieutenant Governor Ben Barnes. Well, now the Democratic Party was divided, had been accused and found guilty, of some elements of it of corruption, and uh, but the Republicans didn't really organize to take advantage of this uh, problem within the Democratic Party. But <clears throat> in 1972, Republican candidate for governor lost, but Richard Nixon, a conservative Republican presidential candidate, um, was reelected and more than two-thirds of Texas voters supported Richard Nixon, a Republican. So when you look at it in the context of the previous 80 or 90, 80 years, that's a significant number of Texans are now voting for a Republican presidential candidate. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, Ronald Reagan ran in 1976 in the primary campaign um, to, to be president. And Ronald Reagan had much appeal for conservatives, both conservatives in the Republican Party and conservatives in the Democratic Party. And Ronald Reagan himself was a former Democrat and he was personally very charming, he spoke simply. If you've never heard any of his uh, jokes or short you know, speeches, you really should go to YouTube and watch them for five or 10 minutes. And you can see he spoke to people in short declarative sentences, always stopped, started off with a funny little speech. And even his most bitter political enemies would concede 
that he was the great communicator. In fact, he was called the great communicator, and many books have been published um, by authorities on public speaking on how to use Ronald Reagan as your model to connect with an audience. He had a real connection uh, when he spoke, and not just in person, but even over the um, over television. And of course, he was a former Hollywood actor. He made several dozen, he starred in several dozen movies. He was never a major, major actor, but um, he certainly knew um, how to use the cameras. Well, in 1976, he did not win the um, presidential nomination for the Democratic Party, but his campaign converted many Texans into Republicans. They left the Democratic Party. <clears throat> now, the next period from 1971 to 1987 is often termed sort of boom and crash. The economy boomed and then there was a crash. And the entire Sun Belt region, the southern part of the United States, during this period of time, in general, experienced a huge growth in population and economic growth. And the Sun Belt phrase is used in contrast to the Frost Belt, which is the northern part of the United States, obviously, and particularly the Midwest. Cities like Detroit, Michigan, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania were really in economic decline at that time. <clears throat> there was a great increase in Texas in manufacturing, and as I mentioned before, the growth of the cities. So there was much more business investment Many more jobs were here. And in fact, many people came to Texas to find a job and through the 19, most of the 1970s. Now nationwide, there was an economic crisis in the early 1970s with high, high inflation rates, high interest rates. Um, there was an economic recession, recession. The price of petroleum increased significantly because the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, reduced output. And, but in Texas, Texas was a major oil exporter, and Texas actually benefited because Texas was getting much more money for each barrel of oil exported. And this had a ripple effect through the entire state. In fact, jobs in Texas increased by 40%, and aggregate income in the state tripled. And during this period of time also, the population grew by 28%. That's almost one third. And so there, obviously there were construction booms to construct homes for all these people, stores, etc. <clears throat> the greatest growth in Houston occurred in large urban areas, particularly the cities of Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio. And now the tremendous economic growth in Texas, Americans outside of Texas started looking at it as perhaps the wave of the future. So Texas fashions and celebrities, you know, really brought Texas in more into the mainstream. Now you might wonder what Texas fashions are. I mean, Texas is not New York City in terms of fashion, but by that I meant cowboy boots, you know, cowboy boots, jeans, the Texas look, Southwestern art, not just from Texas, but from you know, Arizona, New Mexico, that area of the country. Country and Western music um, became very popular throughout the United States. And much of that actually started um, in the city of Austin. And then there were popular films such as Urban Cowboy with John, starring John Travolta, uh, which involved a Texan. And there was a wildly popular television series, Dallas, um, which ran, I for, I've forgotten how many years, uh, about an oil millionaire, or billionaire, I guess you'd say today, and his family. Um, and this was shown actually all over the world when I, I've been traveling um, in several continents and you know people would say, oh, you lived in Texas? Oh, Dallas. Did you ever meet JR? 
Well, J.R. was a fictional figure, but this show really took off. And it, Dallas, if you haven't seen it, it's not a TV show like a Western. He lives on a ranch. It, there's an actual ranch where they filmed it just north of Dallas, which is worth seeing. But he's a, um, you know, an oil executive, and, and it's mainly about his family and his business. So it's not like a typical John Wayne, Texas, Texan kind of movie. Now let's look 1976 to 1988, this period where we start to see the first significant Republican victories, turning the state from one party or Democratic dominance to a viable two-party state. In the 1978 election for governor, the Republicans nominated a well-known um, oil executive from Dallas, Bill Clements. And he very skillfully exploited the, the divisions between the Democratic candidates in the Democratic primary. He also tapped into the na nation, the national level Republican network, including former Texas Congressman George H.W. Bush. Clements won, albeit by a slim margin, and he became the first Republican governor since 1869. That's 100 years. So this was a very, very significant change in the political landscape of the uh, state. And John Tower, you recall, had been elected as a Republican senator uh, six years before, and he was reelected. Now, once in office, Clements had lots of battles because the lieutenant governor is elected separately, and he was a Democrat, Bill Hobby, as well as the attorney general of the state who was elected separately, Mark White. And the legislature in general was dominated by Democrats, but Clements had promised to cut the size and expense of, his, of the state government. Now, just two years later, a few years later, 1980, Ronald Reagan <coughs> was now the Republican presidential candidate. In 1976, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, he was, entered the Republican primary election to become the Republican candidate for the presidency, but lost. But now you have Ronald Reagan as a Republican presidential candidate. And Reagan chose as his running mate to be vice president, George H.W. Bush, who was not originally from Texas. He was from Connecticut, but he moved to Texas shortly after World War II. So he'd been in Texas like 30 something years. So he'd been you know, a long time in Texas. And he was always identified nationally as being a Texan. Well, not only did Ronald Reagan win the presidential election nationwide, he also won Texas with 56% of the vote. Now back on the domestic scene, Governor Clements worked very effectively in 1981 with the Democratic legislature on some laws uh, designed to reduce crime um, consumption of drugs, and they also agreed to increase pay for, for teachers. <clears throat> and Clements surprised everyone by not being reelected in 1982, although in 1986 he came back and was elected governor. In 1982, the Democratic uh, Senator Benson retained his seat. So Texas now was divided. You have Clements Republican losing to a Democrat in 1982. You have the Democratic Senator um, retaining his seat. But what you have now is Texas is really becoming divided politically. So it's a competitive two-party state like most other states in the United States. <clears throat> well, having served as president, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, ran for re-election in 1984, and 
<clears throat> he won by a tremendous margin, particularly because the Democratic candidate was a, a very, very liberal. And so Reagan actually received the votes of many re conservative Democrats, not only in Texas, but across the country. And these are typically referred to as uh, Reagan Democrats. And Ronald Reagan's margin on the Nash, uh, won on the national level, and in Texas, 64%, that's almost two-thirds of Texans voted for Ronald Reagan. So this is becoming very troubling news, obviously, for the Democratic uh, establishment in Texas. And in 1984, the Texans, uh, the, excuse me, the Republicans increased the number of Republican representatives in the Texas House, senators in the Texas Senate, and representatives, U.S. representatives uh, to the U.S. Congress. And Senator, <clears throat> Republican Senator Tower was reelected. But, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Tower was not reelected. He decided he wouldn't run for reelection. And um, a Republican by the name of Phil Graham ran and won the Senate seat that had been vacated by John Tower. So now we saw in 1982, Clements had. Um, lost the governorship to a Democrat. Now in 18, 1986, he comes back. So there's a lot of going back and forth here, as you can see, and that just shows that it's really a viable two-party state. Um, one party is not in office for decades and decades, as happened before under the Democrats. Now, looking at the 1988 presidential race, Ronald Reagan had served two terms, um, and that was the maximum allowed um, by a, co a constitutional amendment. And his vice president, George H. Bush, whom we've already seen uh, from Texas, <clears throat> became the Republican candidate, and he won 56% of the vote in Texas. <clears throat> in this same election, Republicans won many, many offices below the governor's office in Texas. And these are called down ticket offices, or it's often called the coattails because of this strong surge for Republicans. The Republicans won a seat on the all-powerful Railroad Commission, and three members of the Supreme Court became uh, Republican. So now, both at the national elections and the statewide elections, becoming more and more favorable to Republicans every election cycle. The Republicans don't have it locked in yet, as the Democrats had for so many decades, but it's becoming increasingly favorable to the Democrats, excuse me, to the Republicans. <clears throat> now, from the late 80s to 2001, about a 15-year period, you had real modernization and economic recovery in Texas. And this was driven largely by developments of high-tech companies. Um, you had a semiconductor consortium set up in the city of Austin. You had many, many electronic firms and aircraft parts manufacturers in the city of Dallas. And so the economy of Texas was not only recovering, but really modernizing. It was moving beyond oil and traditional agricultural exports. <clears throat> well, agricultural, agriculture, even though it didn't dominate the economy, the agricultural output increased with mechanization and in, increase, uh, improved scientific farming methods. Manufacturing was on the rise. There was increased efficiency. And there were also the many more exports from Texas. And one factor were um, exports to Mexico after the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada entered force in 1994. Texas was perhaps the major beneficiary. Not only did does Texas border Mexico, but Texas manufacturing um, 
had a ready market. And also there was great, great economic growth in sectors such as health care, which many people don't think of as being an economic sector, but it is. It employs hundreds of thousands of people, retail stores, and entertainment of all types. <clears throat> now, by the year 2000, as I mentioned previously, Texas was the second most populous state in the United States after California. And in the previous decade, in the 1990s, Texas, the Texas population had increased more than any other decade in its history. And this growth was largely in urban areas. Houston became the fourth largest city in the country. Dallas, the eighth largest. San Antonio, the ninth. And Austin uh, was the 11th most popular. And uh, Fort Worth, <clears throat> Fort Worth, which as you know, is very close to Dallas, but not considered part of Dallas. Fort Worth was number 12 or 13 in terms of population. In fact, in, by the year 2000, if you took the population of the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, that combined population was more than the population of 32 states in the country. <clears throat> Texas now had become much more diverse by 2000, non-Latino -Latin, whites um, accounted for 52% of the population. Latinos, 32% of the population. Blacks, 12%. And Asians, there was a spectacular rise in the percentage growth of Asians, but it started from a very low base. So they were now 3% of the state population. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now let's move here um, to the 1990 election for governor. Well, Republicans were very optimistic for their candidate. There was great economic prosperity in the state as we just discussed. And they chose as their candidate a rancher from West Texas, Clayton Williams, who spent a tremendous amount of his own personal fortune on the election. And he had a huge, huge lead in the polls initially, some 20 percentage points. His Democratic candidate was Ann Richards. And it looks, you know, many observers think that uh, Richards won only because of the mistakes that Williams made. For instance, Richards was asked something about uh, the weather and he, he made a joke comparing it to rape, which everybody, including Republicans, Democrats, was just aghast about, especially women. Uh, when he, Williams and Richards were meeting at a televised debate, he refused to shake hands with her, which really astounded many people. And then he admitted that he had not paid any taxes in 1986. Well, the net result of that was Williams' large lead evaporated, and in the election, um, Ann Richards won by three points. <clears throat> now, the 1992 presidential election, uh, President George H.W. Bush ran for re-election, and he lost that election, you may recall from your studies of U.S. history, to the Demo Democrat Bill Clinton. But Bush uh, won in Texas with 41% of the vote to Bill Clinton's 37% of the vote. Now you may say, well, that doesn't add, add up to near 100. Well, that's true. Because there was a, thir a major third party candidate, Ross Perot, um, uh, a self-made millionaire in the electronics industry from Dallas. And Ross Perot, entered the contest. Uh, he was extremely, extremely conservative, and he won 22% of the vote. And I think many people believe that if Ross Perot had not entered as a third party candidate, he would have, um, that uh, Bush would have had many more votes and perhaps 
uh, won the election. But be that as it may, um, what this shows is Bush, the Republicans are still strong in uh, 1992 presidential election. <clears throat> now, President Clinton um, decided to appoint the Texas Democrat, Democratic Senator Lloyd Benson to be his Secretary of the Treasury, and so Benson had to resign from the Senate. This created a vacancy, and that was filled by a special election. Well, in that election, a Republican, um, Kay Bailey Hutchison, um, won the special election, uh, defeating the Democratic candidate. Well, now, and I put this in red, you have Republicans holding both Senate seats, and this is the first time since Reconstruction. And since then, Democrats haven't been able to take back either uh, Senate seat. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now let's look quickly at the 1994 election for governor. Uh, Richards, Ann Richards, was defeated by George W. Bush, um, the son of the former president. In 1998, uh, Bush, having served four years, was reelected, and and the Republican senator, the Republican senator, um, uh, Hutchison, was um, also reelected. Both of them received over 60 percent of the vote in Texas. In the United States House of Representatives. Texas at that time had 30 uh, representatives, and Republicans now in 1998 have 11 of the 30 um, representatives. And Republicans in, uh, in Texas also won a majority on the state uh, Supreme Court. Now, there were still a few off major offices in the state controlled by Democrats. The lieutenant governor, who was elected separately from the governor, the attorney general, the state comptroller, and the land commissioner. But those seats, those offices would all be taken over by Republicans within the next two election cycles. Now, President Clinton won the presidency for the first time in 1992. He was easily reelected in 1996, uh, defeating the Republican candidate, Bob Dole. But in Texas, the Republican, Bob Dole, came in first. So at this point, people are saying, wow, the days of the Democrats controlling the state are done with. Well, they were certainly finished for at least, as it turned out, for a number of years. In the 2000 presidential election, George W. Bush defeated the Democratic candidate Al Gore, who of course had been Clinton's vice president. And Bush won 59% of the Texas vote. And Senator Hutchison, Republican senator, was again reelected. So now here by, 19, by 2001, we have Texas was had a stronghold on the state, and the state of Texas, I mean, excuse me, the Republicans had a stronghold on the state, and Texas was as solidly a Republican state as it had been a Democratic state 40 or 50 years earlier. And finally, I just added one slide here because students often ask me why in Texas we have this system where high school class rank is so important in admission to um, the University of Texas and Texas A&M. And in fact, it's an automatic admission. I believe last year it was the top, if you were in the top 6% of your high school graduating class in terms of class rank, you are automatically related, or should be uh, accepted University of Texas in Austin, 
which is the flagship campus of the University of Texas system. And indeed, 75% of the freshmen admitted to UT in Austin are brought in exclusively by their class rank. They don't even have to take the SAT or ACT or get letters of recommendation or anything. Well, what is the origin of this system? Well, the origin is rather interesting. It has to do with 1996. There was a court case, Hopwood versus Texas. Uh, Hopwood was a, a young white man who claimed he'd been discriminated against in admission to the University of Texas because he was white. At that time, the University of Texas, in an effort to promote diversity, um, you know, it was quite transparent that they would consider race as one of the factors uh, to reach uh, uh, diversity in the student population. Well, this went up to a federal district judge and then the court case went up to a federal appeals court. Uh, it didn't go to the Supreme Court and the federal appeals court only covers Texas and one or two other states nearby. And the judge ruled that race could not be a factor in college admission. And there's an article in Canvas, which is optional uh, from a, a law journal explaining this in a little more detail. But the, the judge said the goal of a diverse student body is, is a very admirable goal and encouraged the University of Texas system to come up with some other scheme to achieve diversity without <clears throat> explicitly taking race into account. So the classic affirmative action um, ended right there. So in an attempt to get um, a diverse entering class, they started to use high school class rank to achieve racial as well as ethnic diversity. Because of course, Hispanics or Latinos are not a separate race under US law. They're rather considered an ethnicity. And the, the, the thought was, well, you go down to the uh, Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, where the vast majority of the people are Hispanics. If you take the top percent of the high school class, you'll be bringing in lots of Hispanics. And similar for areas with lots of blacks. And this was originally called the top 10% system because the first few years when this started, they only... They, being in the top 10% of your class rank got you automatically admitted. But now there are many, many more students applying. And so they brought that down. And I believe last year it was six or 5% um, uh, to get into the University of Texas in Austin. And in fact, you can go to the University of Texas system website and they have an annual report on this that is sent to the governor and the legislature to let them know how this system is working in terms of uh, achieving the goal of having a diverse freshman class at the University of Texas. This, by the way, will not be on the exam, the slide or anything I said, but this is just because so many students um, are interested in how this came to be. And it's relevant because it took place in the 1990s. Okay, and we have one more lecture in this course. And we're going to be looking at Texas after 2001 just briefly. Thank you very much.